Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Maddie Dietz and I will be interviewing Tamora Pierce today, Tammy, who's a absolutely influential figure in the fantasy and young adult writing world. <laughs> and uh, I have the honor of asking her a few questions today. Please feel free to put any questions you'd like to ask her in the Q&A, which you can find at the bottom um, tab of your screen. And we'll be answering them later on in the hour. Okay, I'm just gonna get... Wonderful. All right, so first and foremost, Tammy. Oh, yeah. can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Wonderful, okay. I was worried I had a little Wi-Fi blip. Uh, yep. First question for you. Um, what originally drew you to fantasy? Are there any books or stories in particular that sort of sparked your inspiration in that field? Well, not exactly. Um, part of it was that in our house, we had a lot of authors between my dad being a radar holic and my mother being in college at the time. And so I got exposed to a major level of myths and legends. I remember reading um, The Thousand and One Nights in fourth grade. Um, I read Robin Hood, the, his story. Before that, I graduated to World Myth and Legends in sixth grade um, with the Egyptians started there and I would just get obsessed with these areas and societies and getting started my dad when I was in sixth grade got me telling stories to myself as I did dishes and rather than say Tammy people would think you're nuts if you talk to yourself he said I should write a book and he made it very clear that he thought this was a righteous idea. He said I could use his typewriter. Up until that moment in time, the typewriter was a forbidden object, um, almost a holy grail. He did his union newsletter on it. So I knew he thought this writing thing for me was a big deal to let me have permission to use it. And he even gave me my first idea. I said, what should I write about? And he thought about it. And like I say, we traded books and television and music all the time. And he said, why not travels in a time machine? And I had been pretending in time periods for a long time and I just, the little geek that I was, I thought I could pretend I went back in time to the Trojan War. And I started writing and he, my parents broke up completely a year later. He took the typewriter, but by then I was hooked and was willing to write stories down on any slice of paper I found. And that was when my seventh grade, in my seventh grade year, my teacher caught me moaning over the books in our classroom. She said, what's the matter? And I said, I don't have anything to read, which was my cry for years and years and years. I see you understand. Um, and uh, she handed me this book called The Fellowship of the Ring by some guy named Tolkien. And I finished it at two o'clock the next morning and I cried because I thought there wasn't any more. Fortunately, there was. And I went from that to um, Lloyd Alexander. Um, and I was also starting to get into more adult literature and I discovered science fiction but all of those things piled in and became some sort of mush, and I was pulling ideas out of that. And I hit a bad spot. My uh, 
sophomore year in high school, the end of the year, to my junior year in college, where I was unable to write any or original fiction of my own. Um, I could write poetry badly. Uh, that for those of you who are about to ask, I buried it. I have no idea where it is. I never wanted to come up. If they'd let me have matches, I'd have burned it. Um, the you are your own worst critic theory of thought. You got to be wary for that, but I did um, ended up just destroying a lot of work actually. That way was how I learned. And in that time, I wrote for the student newsletter at uh, my high school. I won a speech contest um, locally. Um, I. Was, I was writing two friends of mine at a shared universe, science fiction, and they would let me write in it. So I was doing that, but nothing of my own until summer before my junior year in college. I had gone to college um, and taken the um, track for becoming a mental health professional with teenagers, but A, I flunked the... Uh, math requirement twice each time, and B, for some unknown reason, before my junior year, I began to write again, my own stuff. I didn't regard that, all other stuff. And um, by January after um, the, the class where I took writing for short stories and met my mentor, David Bradley. Um, I did various stories and film plays. And then Bradley thought it was time I tried a novel. So I did. You'll never see it. No one will ever see it. I buried it in a very ceremonious way. I don't even remember where the dang thing is. But I left college, I got my degree a year later after convincing them I, I'd taken enough classes for crying out loud. And they sort of followed a track. But after December of 07, I think, I got this idea for a story about this girl who wants to be a knight but has to disguise herself as a guy to do it. And, well, I was off to the races. That's absolutely lovely. Uh, what do you think made the difference with that inner, inner critic sort of uh, tipping point? What made you want to start writing your own work again? I don't think it was my inner critic. I mean, my inner critic has been with me forever and ever. Um, gray all over, poor thing, and drinks a lot. Um, it was... I had come to some understanding of my dysfunctional family at that point. Um, I had come to acknowledge that my mother was abusive and dealing with her and helping my sisters as best as I could. They were much younger than me. And um, it was just something I woke up, well, I tried to write a realistic type fiction because my mentor said he'd like to see something about my childhood. And I did try, but I don't know about other people, but. I find it dead boring, even then. And I was running out of steam and I thought, when was it I used to write like falling off a log? What was I doing then? And I remembered I had discovered fantasy. I had been reading mythological stories so as soon as I could learn to read. Um, and I thought maybe for a first novel, 
what's important is that I finish a first novel, not what I write about. So I thought of the, the idea that I kept coming back to that girl night and I finished it by the end of my senior year and it stank on ice. Uh, it was 110 pages long and um, the good parts carried over, but I pretty much buried it down a deep, deep well where I would never find it. And November of that year, I woke from sleeping with a dream image and I don't remember what it was, but whatever it was, it sat me down at my boyfriend's table and started typing about these two kids, twins, who don't want the future that dad has picked, has ordered for them. And they come up with the idea of switching places. And eight, eight months later, I had a eight, was it eight months? It was June, so December to June. Seven months later, I had a 800 plus page single book that I titled The Song of the Lioness. And that was the start of things. I'd also made other sales. I did, uh, I reviewed martial arts movies for a while. Um, I did confession stories for Confession Magazine while I was in college, which People look down their noses at, but hey, I was full scholarship. It was money. So I tinkered with a bunch of other stuff that was not necessarily fantasy. But that first Alana manuscript is where I began. That's wonderful. And um, I know that uh, your and has a long, long list of wonderful recommendations for TV shows, movies, books. So kind oh, of yeah. combined with your um, varied um, writing background, how do you think other mediums of writing, of media in general, affect your writing? Um, well, I like to read the product a lot of the times. Um, one of my biggest thrills once I started motoring along was publishers started asking me if I would take a look at this book they'd been working on and see if I could do a quote from it. And that, that was really great until, of course, I had to write something that was, what, maximum two sentences long that would in, intrigue and uh, enchant readers into taking a chance on this new writer. And I can't say hello on two lines. So that was a challenge, but that was one of the things I did. Um, a friend of mine, I started subscribing to Locus Magazine, which is the science fiction and fantasy and um, Bible almost for fans. Um, but a lot of us also subscribe. And Michael Burstein, um, who was one of the people who read my stuff. Um, we got together for dinner one night in New York, and he discovered I had never been to a con. And he was just flabbergasted. And I just said, they just never came my way. So he talked me into going to my first um, science fiction fantasy convention um, in Boston. And... I got to like doing that, going to different cons, meeting other writers. Because I, during the time I was working on the Cal books, except for my day job, I am a semi-recluse. And once I'd be able to live off my writing, I became pretty much a three quarters to 80% recluse, dealing better with animals than people so this was a way to meet my fellow pros, to meet fans, and to freshen out my brain a bit with new ideas. That's wonderful. Yeah, finding that 
community with other writers can be so, so helpful. So I'm oh, glad you're here to continue that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it got to be very important to me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I made a lot of when I went to Bosco and haven't been in a couple of years, but when I went, I'd always hang out with the fans. And it would be fun just to listen to the, what they think, what they do, who they are. I do that almost every place I go, if I get a chance. Just because I tell people I have cooler fans than anybody. And especially when I'm about to do a school appearance or a library appearance, you know, and they look at me and you know they're thinking, sure, she has to say that because they pay for everything. But then they meet my fans and they come back looking like they've been hit with a leather pipe, uh, no, a stronger pipe. And they go, you really do have cooler fans than anybody. And I say, I know. I know. Yeah, you were aware from the very start. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yes, a number of them do write and they all mention me at some point, which still leaves me going, yeesh. I've got another um, question for you. Oh, is my Wi Fi being rude? It's, it's being okay. weird. I think That's my okay. Wi-Fi is back. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. It is being weird. It is being yeah. weird. Uh, I've got another question for you um, regarding the action scenes in your book. Yeah. Books, many books. Yeah. <laughs> they always feel so smooth and well thought out and natural. How do you manage that when there's so many moving pieces? Um, I've read a lot of really good authors on the subject, not that they write about writing, but that the, the uh, action in their books made me think a great deal. Um, I've always read a lot of action and adventure since I was a kid, my dad started me. Um, I fell in love with Robin Hood at the age of five. And as soon as I could read, I was reading his legends and then moving on to other legends. Um, but for the actual process of action, that watching things over and over again that makes everybody around you go, again? Um, the best people I ran into as a kid, uh, Basil Rathbone did a couple of movies, one with Errol Flynn, and Errol Flynn was the hero, and one with Danny Kay, um, the court jester. And Basil Rathbone was the bad guy in both of them. And his sword work in those movies, I would watch it over and over and over again. And the same with uh, the muscle pictures of with the stories from Rome and um, from Israel and the sailing people. Um, I would watch those movies and television shows, anything I could find. And when I could move to New York City in the 80s, um, we had a martial arts school right down the hall from us. Um, and so I actually tried putting myself in that position it's besides watching it. And I did find until my first test that would move me up to an official rank, I tore the, linen, the muscles on the back of my knee and took me a year to hobble around without a cane again. And so much for my art, martial arts career. But I still go, went to classes for different skills. Um, I still go to Ren Faire displays every chance I get. And you follow what the characters are doing, what the students and the teachers are doing. And certain things hook your brain you gradually acquire a knowledge of what's required. Um, 
I once was critiquing a go, oh no, I won't tell that story. No, the story I'll tell is uh, my friend Raquel, who's Thayet, by the way, in the Kel and Alana and Dane books, Queen, Queen Thayet. Um, she asked me to take a look at her manuscript. And uh, I got to the sex part. And I said, well, Rock, you got to see the way you've got it written here. This is going here, not there. This is going to go there, not here. This is, and she just, just shut up. Give me back the manuscript. Shut up. And I'm there, but Rock, it's not realistic. They have to be able to enter into it. So if you just, you know, fix these things up and she just, that, yeah, don't let your friends review your work. But honestly, it wasn't that much longer than after that when we picked up a, what looked like an interesting uh, fantasy book. And I was reading it we were over at Raquel's, and I was reading it, and things weren't coming together like the author thought they should. And yeah, you've got to read and see, and in, I, I didn't so much take notes on jousts and um, fist fighting and writing and stuff. But I socked away what I needed to know. And that's basically how I did it. The, the action scenes, I had taken that year's worth, of course. My friend was uh, trying out for uh, martial, uh, martial arts school. And I went with her to different schools in the city um, and watched how they worked out, the judo schools as well. And also I was in, I was reviewing martial arts movies or martial arts movie magazine. And you can tell back then at any rate, before they got to speeding things up and tricks like that, you can tell when something won't work no matter what you do, but they say it did anyway. I don't know if that helps or not, but just watching movies and going to, uh, demonstrations and stuff for fighting is what you can do. Yeah, practical research sounds very useful. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to ask one more question here, and then I think we can transfer over to the Q&A to make sure everyone in there gets their questions answered okay. as well. So my final question is, this is obviously a very hectic, very crazy year, and I've heard many varied accounts from different writers about how they're being creative or not fully being creative in this time. How do you like to interact with media during this year? Well, I hit a bad patch in terms of my health for the last two years and was struggling just to find out what was wrong and to get it treated. And now I am sort of feeling my way back into the field. Um, I, one of the prizes that we did for a fundraiser for Black Lives Matter was I promised to write a, what I call a squib, three to five pages, and the person who bought that got to pick their two favorite characters, and I would write a scene for those two characters. And I thought I should do a trial run. A friend of mine was having a really low year and I asked her to pick her two fit I actually gave her three so don't tell but she it was a really bad year and I started to write she picked Numair and Dane and I said since it was a gift uh like she could pick one other kitten the dragonette and that sort of ran a little long for a squib, like 
25 pages. So now I'm working on Lark and Rose Thorne's first meeting, and I'm looking at page 17 and going, I need to cut some here. But that's, that's what I've been doing, and it's making me excited again because I'm not struggling and getting nothing. I actually have something concrete there. And um, I am on the side starting to get back to Tempests and Slaughter, which is the next Hiram book. And I was in the middle of a major overhaul when all this hit, but basically it's about him and Ozorn and Varese coming of age and what that means for each of them. Aram most of all, obviously. So now I've got people sending in their requests for squibs, and I think I can do it without boiling over too much. That's good to hear. I'll keep my fingers crossed too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think we should move on over to the Q&A. Okay. I can start asking questions from here. I'm just going to go from the earliest question down to the most recent. Okay. So starting with number one, are Numer and slash or George bisexual or otherwise not straight? Uh, I think probably they're, they are omnisexual. Um, I haven't written about it yet, um, but certainly the opportunities are there and they're both extremely, um, in, in adventurous men. And I'm sure they tried during their teen years, especially teen years, particularly in Aram, of course, is in that, um, friend group with Ozorn and Varese, and they're pretty wide open to things. I may not cover it, but that doesn't mean, I only got used to bringing it up publicly um, in the last 10 years or so. So, and I do it for the more modern things because my fans haven't formed a passion for those characters yet. It's sometimes when someone who's deeply invested in your work, you do something that hits them on the feelings, it's really hard to backtrack from that or to say, well, it's okay because of this. Yeah, there can be some difficult complexities there. Yeah, and also you don't, I, I have had enough people step on my dreams. Um, one, one particularly stopped me writing for five years. Um, I am not going to do that to anyone else. If, if it comes up, then it'll be there. If it doesn't, I hope they'll understand I'm an old fart. All right, and next up, what inspired you to explore gender role reversal in Alana? Did you ever feel like you were treated differently or had less access because of your gender? I grew up in the 50s and the 60s. You bet I got sass about my gender. You bet that it was hard to make your way as an independent speaker. I was once introduced to a guest to our eighth grade classroom as. Um, this is Tammy, she's our women's liver. And I'm there, well, yeah, but I, is that an issue? Um, I was raised to be a feminist. My mother was a feminist. We were watching a TV commercial one time. She says, I just realized I'm a radical feminist and you're more middle of the road. And I didn't see a problem with that, but I guess she did. Um, I, okay, what was the question again? Absolutely. Um, the question was, what inspired you to explore gender role, gender role reversal in Alana? 
when I when I got into science fiction, when I got into fantasy, um, it was like being well, no, I can't blame it on the Edgar Rice Burroughs move books because Edgar Rice Burroughs, you know, people think of him as old fashioned and non relevant, but he had strong women in all of his books. They may not have been wearing much clothes in one or two, but I'm thinking of the Mars books. But Jane was not some silly creature perched up in a tree shrieking. She was as good with weapons as a, as any of the men who worked for them when they moved back to Africa. Um, and he had in his other works, always there were a handful of strong women and those among their own sex who disapproved of them, which is something you didn't see for a long time. It was like all women band together. And I'm like coming fresh out of Penn Women's Center. I am there to tell you, uh, actually, no, they don't. Um, I had a sense of humor. At that point in time, apparently, that was an international crime. I could have been arrested. And what really grounded in for the people who disliked me was that people would come to the center and say, um, I can't return the uh, questionnaire you put on the back of Tammy Pierce's articles because my boyfriend and I love them. So can I just write this down here? That did not sit well. But I can't, I, I was a lot more ready for the third wave and the fourth wave of feminism. Or at least you could like a guy and not have to mess it all up. It's dirty. Next is what are your best tips toward world building? The great critical line, critic Lionel Trilling said these wide word, wise words, which I carry around in my heart, and I welcome you to do the same. He wrote, the immature artist imitates, the mature artist steals. I encourage you to steal openly and utterly from whatever hits your fancy. The thing about being creative is that sooner or later, you're going to start to get urges. No, not those urges, different urges. But you will want to see every martial arts movie you can get access to. You want to see how to ride Western style um, when you either have learned English or you just don't know how to ride. But you want to try it and see all, all about it, see other people doing it, hear other people talking about it, no matter what that thing is. And your family and your friends will stand there and say, you have no follow through on your last obsession. What you're doing is you are laying the base for your creativity. You are taking in all these ideas. And this doesn't stop with your first production, your first book, your first painting, or even the 20th or the 50th, you're going to be doing that all your career as uh, someone who creates. And this is where you get a lot of your ideas. When I get stuck, I will go to my old ideas and I think of it as a file cabinet and whiffle through. I needed a civil war for... Uh, the Dane books for the fourth book. And I was stuck. I couldn't think of anything. And I'm not good at making stuff up cold. I need a place to start. So I riffled through my obsessions and hit my obsession with the American War in Vietnam when I was growing up. And I remembered Francis Fitzgerald's Fire on the Lake about the inner war being fought between the Montagnard tribesmen, tribespeople, and both the north and southern halves of the country. 
because they want to end the uh, relationship that the Green Berets, who are up in those mountains doing um, private sort of work. Engaging small camps and fighting and stuff like that. But they bonded with the Montagnards and learned a lot about hunting in wilderness and local foods and the languages from those mounting yards. And I went, that's what I need. That's what I'm looking for. So I created Thayat's Home Realm. And a lot of the names come from place names or names in the cultures of Southeast Asia. Um, and there's a civil war going on and the oppression of the Khmer tribes. I had it all there. All I needed to do was just open up. So if you get stuck, start looking at your obsessions. And I don't care if they fit or not, if they're in that period or not. They might have some bit of something that you go, got it. I spent an hour on a telephone conversation with the head camel mahout at the Bronx Zoo. Very nice man. Uh, because I needed Dane to find a sick camel in a part of that book that didn't actually make the final cut. But I learned an awful lot of good things from this guy. And he seemed awfully tickled that somebody would actually call him and get it right. That's wonderful. A well-cultivated collection of obsessions is very necessary. I oh, agree. Yeah. And that they will hit you in the face like a loaf of wet bread I think as you go grow and learn and discover more. Um, I get ideas from maps. I have a huge collection of maps. I have three shelves of cookbooks. I don't cook. Um, you add to that as you go. And the whole idea for me anyway is to point out to people, you don't have to be afraid of your process. You don't have to grind your brain into mush to suit someone else's idea for how you should go about writing. I go with whatever works because I'm cheap and sleazy. So is mom and that's why I'm here. Um, I stole that, by the way. Uh, Go with your gut, and if you need something, go after it. You may not put it to use right now, but I guarantee you down the line, you will need that bit of information. Absolutely. Thank you. Got another one for you here. What inspired the religions and pantheons in Tortal, Karthak, the Copper Isles, the Yamini Islands, etc.? Again, I say... The immature artist imitates. The mature artist steals. Um, I have, in my library, I have all of these foreign language books, all the ones that I can read, uh, not the ones that translate to another language or another type. Um, I have all those books on warfare in the Middle East, in Middle in the Middle Ages. I have, like I say, the cookbooks. I have uh, two full long shelves that are nothing but foreign language uh, books, tourist guides, but also dictionaries. I need to get control of my map situation because my maps are in three different sets of shelves by now. Uh, you never know what will work. And so the Amelon stuff and the Tortal stuff, I started somewhere with Tortal, obviously, medieval Europe, particularly England, Scotland, Wales. But by the time I got to the end of the Dane books, I was, or Kel books, and I was looking around or something different, um, I looked at my obsession 
to the Central Asia. And I also wanted a climate that was further south. So I got my National Geographic map and uh, the thing is spread. My brain is blipping on me. It's the map, National Geographic map for um, the Mediterranean and area. And I had been working on the Kell books while I was thinking about a new universe. And I had the map of, of the battlegrounds and countries of Southeast Asia. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, it's got climate, it's got all kinds of cuisines. I bet if I fiddled with the, the map a bit, I could also use place names and people's names, not very well-known people or parts of their names. Never, never, never admit to someone that you borrowed from them unless you really, really, really trust them. And even then, I'd think twice. But I took the map, I copied it, I wiped out a bunch of places and things like uh, railways and stuff, copied it down again, um, worked on it some more, and eventually came up with what is mostly one half of the globe for the circle universe the circle of language. I had places where I already had the bases for names and place names and also costume. I have books and books and books of clothes from other realms because you never know when you'll need them. And actually for the first Circle of Magic book, I had a source for period things and one of the things they had was kits for spinning from a hand spindle. So I got the kit. It had fur, sheep, sheep's wool. It had um, some that was partly spun, some that, some that was not spun at all. And it had a, for a TV thing that you could watch and do what the teacher was doing. So that's how I learned about Sandry and Lark and thread, and thread magic, because most magical systems, you, you'll find that thread magic is an important part. So I pulled it together from different countries, different locations, which is why Summer Sea is so warm, and the empire at the top of the map is so cold, because I based Kugisco on St. Petersburg back in the day, only more islands to go to and from. That's how I do it. We have about five minutes left. But okay. does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. That was wonderful. It's how I, it's, I do that for all the places that I create because I'm not good at staying, still not good at making stuff up. I go to a place that I think will fit and I start borrowing from there. That's absolutely wonderful. Okay, we've got less than five minutes left. Do you think we could get in one more question? Sure. Wonderful, okay. Um, let's see here. Hi from the UK. I've loved your book since I was eight and am now 32. Do you regularly spend time in the worlds you've created when not writing or is it something that you actively have to enter when you begin research for each book? By the time I need research, I have a general idea of what forces I'm going to be writing about, uh, what uh, society and what kind of culture they have. Um, if not, I'll go through my books and the one that says spring, I'll pick it up and start looking. I have a lot of picture books. Um, I rely on picture books. Because the one thing I'm not good at is imagining physical things without something to start from. Um, 
I'm sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, it was, do you regularly spend time in the worlds you write, or do you have to enter them as you begin writing them? The first, the first book in each of the ones, each series I've done, yeah, I have to spend some time in the culture at first just to see where I'm going. But I usually write by, I have a rough idea by the time I talk to my agent and my editor um, of what I'm doing. And I've pieced at that at home saying, I want to try this kind of character. I want them dealing with these kinds of issues. And I'll just start picking. And then when I have something I think will intrigue a publisher, that's when I take it to them. Up until then, I'm mostly going by ear, going by what I think the culture needs, what the characters need. Um, that makes the idea separate from what I've done before. Tortal is getting tricky because where do I go next? Apart from finishing, which I'd really like to do. Um, the circle, not so much because I have, uh, I have one book overdue. there that I would like to get done. And um, yeah, I just walk around with stuff buzzing in my head until I can make it concrete. That is absolutely wonderful. Okay, we're going to wrap up here. Tammy, thank you so much for answering so many questions and for telling your amazing stories. Thanks, Maddie. It was lovely meeting you. Good luck with your own work. Thank you so much. I greatly, greatly appreciate that. And everyone, I hope you have a fantastic time at the rest of the conference. Yes, indeed. I'm on next again.